Today on This Week in Iowa, we explore the race for Ward 3 in Des Moines. We hear from the incumbent and his two challengers, why each says they are the best for the job. But first, a special session to vote on redistricting lines. We'll break down what the session means for the next decade in Iowa politics. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being with us on This Week in Iowa. I'm Sabrina Ahmed. Iowa's legislative and congressional maps remain up in the air after the Senate voted down the first proposed map and adjourned this week. The vote in the Senate was down party lines. It happened less than three hours into the session. The Legislative Services Agency now has 35 days to draft a second map proposal and introduce it to the General Assembly. They say they'll only take 16. From there, the earliest lawmakers can take a vote is seven days after it's officially proposed. If the second drawing is denied, there's potential for a third. So I spoke to an attorney about what this all means. Okay, we are joined now by Gary Dickey, who is a Des Moines attorney, to discuss uh, the three hour long special session and um, the Senate denying that proposal of the redistricting map from the LSA. Gary, thank you so much for being with us. Talk to me about what this three hour long special session means and really what those political implications are of denying the redistricting map. Well, thank you for having me. Short answer is it means we go back to the drawing board. Uh, the Legislative Service Agency has another 35 days to prepare a second map. They're supposed to address the specific concerns that were identified by the Iowa Senate. Um, as voiced by a few senators, there was con some concern about how some of the um, state districts were drawn in terms of their shape. Um, so that will be taken into consideration and they will resubmit a second plan to the Iowa General Assembly. They've indicated that that will take place by October 21st. If they reject it, then we go back to a third map. The same process occurs. The Legislative Service Agency has another 35 days to submit a third map. But at that point, the process is different and the Iowa General Assembly can amend that map any way they see fit um, according to the regular rules of order for the legislature. So I guess only time will tell. <laughs> to be continued. Uh, and takeaway for just an Iowan sitting at home, watching this interview, trying to conceptualize why they should care. Why should someone at home care? Well, the idea is that every person's vote should count the same. And so we should have a process where uh, an individual in one district, uh, their vote has the same effect in terms of electing people to the state house and to the national Congress, the United States Congress in the same way. Um, Iowa has an excellent process that takes a lot of the politics out of that by placing the map drawing process with the legislative services agency, which is nonpartisan. Um, we are often referred to as the gold standard. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, uh, we, we elect excellent members to Congress um, and we have good representation and that promotes democracy um, and good governance. Uh, if we were to put politics into that process, then you could see gerrymandering resulting, um, and that, that doesn't benefit Iowans at all. Short break here on This Week in Iowa. Up next, we meet the candidates for Des Moines City Council Ward 3 and begin with incumbent Josh Mandelbaum. That's coming up next. You're watching This Week in Iowa. We move now to exploring the race for Ward 3 on Des Moines City Council. Three candidates, the incumbent Josh Mandelbaum, then challenger Brandi Weber, and challenger Corey McAnally. Then we start with Josh Mandelbaum. He is currently representing his first term in the third ward. He was born and raised in Des Moines, an environmental attorney at a nonprofit. He previously worked as the policy advisor to Governor Tom Vilsack. This morning, we get to know Mandelbaum and why he wants to continue in his post. We're investing over $400 million in our roads. When I started on council, less than 25% of our roads were in good or excellent condition. With the investments we're making, we're gonna get that up to 50, 60% more by the end of the decade. So we're gonna transform our roads. We're addressing storm sewers as well. We're investing in neighborhoods uh, it, through Invest DSM and creating stronger corridors like what's going on on Ingersoll and University. Uh, we're reconstructing Fleur Drive. We're investing in McRae Park uh, that will be 
one of our signature parks when it's done, and it will be a great gateway to that whole Southwest Ninth Corridor. And we're tackling, we're tackling major problems like climate change and doing the things that we can at the local level, passing a 24-7, 100% clean energy standard, uh, and uh, starting the transition to electric vehicles, which is more sustainable, and it's saving the city money. So we're doing all of those things and more, and there's so much more work to do, so much to build on, and all of those things will continue to strengthen our community, and I want to keep doing that. Obviously, I live in Des Moines, Iowa. I understand the, um, the draw for the city, but how do you continue to um, incentivize people to live and work in Des Moines? Yeah, well, you've got you've to create a, a great place for folks to, to live and work. And we've got natural advantages that we have to lean into that the, the suburbs don't have and can't have. You know, you're not going to have the density. You're not going to be able to recreate what we have on Ingersoll. You obviously need strength in our, our education system. You know, I feel good about the Des Moines Public Schools. I'm a Des Moines Public School graduate myself. I'm a public school parent. You know, my kids are going to Greenwood Elementary School, and even in the challenging year that, that they had with COVID, uh, I was really impressed with the caliber of the teachers and everything that went into that. And in the Des Moines Public Schools, we serve a diverse population. It's a, uh, socioeconomically diverse, it's racially diverse, uh, it's diverse in uh, native language and the, the language folks speak. And what, what the measure is and where I think the Des Moines schools really do better than people give it credit for is it takes the student where they are and grows every student. And I know that happens and I have complete confidence in Des Moines Public Schools' ability to keep doing that, but we've got to work with them and partner with them. A large number of people out of this Des Moines community coming and saying, police aren't doing our community a service they are targeting us. Um, the city council b uh, passed a ban on racial profiling. Um, there was a request and perhaps a demand for a, a community, um, a civilian oversight committee. committee. Yeah, so for, first off, I, I mean, we have a lot of great public servants uh, in our police department, in our fire department, you know, they're dedicated to our community. They have difficult jobs. They, they don't get to duck any problem, right? And they're doing, they're doing a good job, they're working hard, and they're serving our community well. That doesn't mean that we can't do better and that we shouldn't challenge ourselves to do better and constantly be working to do better. And our racial profiling ban is a piece of that. Investing in quality, independent, uh, third parties to do de-escalation training is a piece of that. Looking at our policies and practices, you know, as part of our racial profiling ordinance, we put our police uh, policies and procedures online for the first time. And in, in looking at those policies and procedures, we have room to align with national best practices. Yet still, the city council meetings are being disrupted. They, they feel unheard but you feel like you can't get business done. What has that been like? Well, it, it's, been, it's been challenging. Um, and first off, I'll, I'll say I, I think that we can and should listen longer, but that, that's only a piece of it, right? There are lots of ways that you can connect and interact. You can connect with us via email or phone. Uh, I've been willing to meet with folks uh, in forums and outside of the uh, outside of council meetings. Uh, we do have to get our business done during council meetings, but we also have to listen to folks and engage with folks. And I'm committed to doing that. Uh, but uh, there's uh, sometimes, and one of the tricks in this job, uh, people think if you're not doing exactly what they want, you're not listening. And I represent 55,000 people. And there's a diversity of opinion and diversity in, in terms of the solutions and how they want me spending time and what they want me working on. And I'm gonna try my best to listen to all of them and then take that input and make the best decisions I can. 
We have much more with Mandelbaum on our website. That's weareiowa.com. And uh, it's, it's, there's so much more discussion about food insecurity, affordable housing, clean water. And we meet the challenger to Mandelbaum coming up next. Why Brandy Weber decided to run for council. You're watching This Week in Iowa. Brandy Weber decided to run for city council to be a voice for the voiceless and to help the homeless population in Des Moines as a promise to her daughter. We start this morning with our discussion on population and how to get people to live in the city, not the suburbs. Our city budget is a mess. We need to completely reprioritize where our money is going. And one of the things that has really suffered and has been like grossly defunded is our education system. We have buildings that are falling apart. We have students that can't learn in the environment or with the tools they're currently being supplied. Um, we have teachers that are underpaid. If we were to take a hard long look at the budget, we would find the money. And that, and I mean, that could play into affordable housing as well. Can you give me an example of where there is too much money going to a program that you think is overfunded in the city? Well, it's not necessarily a program, but most, if not all, of our high-ranking officials in our city are making double, if not more, the national average for that position. Now, we live in a big city. Um, in Iowa standards. So there's no reason we sh our high officials shouldn't be making a percentage more than the Iowa national average. But that's not what's happening. We are, we are essentially paying people more than double what they need to survive in our city and it's bankrupting us. You mentioned food insecurity, an issue that you faced as a young child. Um, you know, now that I'm a mom, the idea of not being able to feed my kids is a devastating thought. Yeah. That is heart-wrenching. Um, there are, what, seven, more than 70% of kids in the city of Des Moines are on free and reduced lunch. Yeah. There is, more than half of our city is food insecure. Yes. What can be done to fix that problem? Well, I think, again, this is a budget issue. The city if they prioritized it, could afford to make sure that free and reduced lunch just turns into free lunch. That, for all students, um, that ends the stigma. There was a social reckoning that started last year. Mm -hmm. Talk to me first about your reaction to seeing that group of protesters, of course, taking over the city of Des Moines, but then also taking their demands straight to the mayor's front yard. Yeah. Well, I would say it didn't start in the front yard. It didn't start with signs and chants. It started with concerned community members going through the right channels. Um, I've spoken to a lot of those demonstrators and they requested meetings with city council members that went ignored. Um, if they were answered, they were met with empty promises of town halls that never happened. They um, or they went, they, you know, they tried to talk to the council member one-on-one, -on -one, then they were shut down, so they brought it to the council, and then the council responded with that community input with harsher and harsher speaking restrictions, and now it's to a point where only 25 people are allowed in the room, they're being incredibly inaccessible, not only on a one-on-one -on -one level, but also the meetings. Um, they're refusing to do a hybrid Zoom meeting, so persons who can't be there in, in person to speak on consent agenda items or whatever, just are out of luck. They don't have a voice. So I think that all of that boiled over into, well, if, if I don't have a voice either way, I'm, I'm gonna be louder. Do you believe that the city of Des Moines should defund the police? Well, that's a, that's a hot 
topic right now, right? And it's easy to throw around hot button. Well, it's not a hot button issue. The, mm -hmm. There have been BLM members who have said to the city council members, I won't talk to you until you tell me you're going to defund the police. Right. So there's a stalemate. Oh no, for sure. And I, I didn't mean hot button issue, I meant ho like hot button term. Because all defunding the police really means is refunding the community. We are pumping a bunch of money, 39% of our city budget goes into the police department and those are all reactionary programs, right? We need to take some of that money, take some of those resources and put it into a program outside of the police department where we have trained professionals responding to mental health crisis calls, um, calls about our houseless neighbors who just need help. Um, you know, calls about addiction services. We could have social workers, EMTs, addiction specialists responding to these calls, and they do stuff like this all the time without brute force. We have much more with Brandy Weber on our website, weareiowa.com, and coming up next, we'll hear from the third challenger. You're watching This Week in Iowa, now to Corey McAnally. He's a resident of the Drake neighborhood with a long history of getting a hand up. And when it came his time to offer help, he says he found city council to be the place that needed someone like him. Take a listen to his story. My parents were 17 when they had me on the east side of the state, uh, born to a very uh, poor family. Uh, my dad was going to be the first one in our family to have ever gone to college, but gave up on that dream because he had me. Uh, so he joined and enlisted in the Marines. My parents got divorced when I was eight years old, and so uh, my mom ended up moving back to Wisconsin and lived in a trailer in the middle of a field in rural Wisconsin. I had a sister who was born who was born with a, a, a genetic issue, a, a deletion of one of her chromosomes, a part of one of her chromosomes. And so uh, even from a young age, uh, having to interact, getting to, sorry, getting to interact with the you know, uh, a lot of the organizations that, you know, my family didn't have a lot of money paying for medical bills. All of those things impacted me and make me see those struggles around me today. You talk about housing insecurity and food insecurity and people with issues where, you know, they rely on the city and the resources, not just the city, but the philanthropies and other organizations that really give a hand up uh, to those people in our community. And it's not just we need to do better than just give lip service to those people, right? Because we're trying to get people to come to Des Moines, live in Des Moines, work from Des Moines, stay in Des Moines, make them feel safe in Des Moines, and all of these things are going to really impact. So let's dive into a lot of the topics that you just brought up. One, uh, the first being population in Des Moines. What is the answer? I mean, the schools um, have seen decreasing students enrolling in their, their, um, in their classes for multiple years, well before the pandemic. The pandemic only amplified the problem. Employers can't find workers. Workers can't find work. What's the answer? Yeah, you know, the answer is it's, it's not simple. As, as you can imagine, it's a complex puzzle because we, as, as you mentioned, we're coming out of the pandemic and, you know, businesses are trying to bring workers who now work from home and have understand how flexibility can be integrated into life, right? We're in your living room here today, right? right? <laughs> uh, so so we, we, we appreciate how there are going to be new models uh, for working. And, and, and I, I kind of alluded to it a minute ago, you know, we're on the national stage competing with cities like Austin and Columbus, right? What, you know, how do we get people to come work from Des Moines, even though they may be working somewhere else. And, and I think, you know, part of it is, is, is revitalizing our downtown for that specific issue. We need to make sure that our downtown is a place that people say, I want to go live there because I've got all the amenities. I want to spend the night. I want to eat at the restaurants. I want to have great restaurants. I want to have great, um, uh, you know, exercise activities. And, and you see that being built up, but then you also see, you know, we you know, get a headline because of safety downtown, right? And, and that starts with collaboration, communication, and trust, right? I think right now we have a big issue with that in Des Moines, particularly between city council and a lot of other organizations. I mean, tune into the city council meeting, right? there's a trust issue right now. Whether it's a trust issue between the citizens and city council or city council and some of the various organizations, we need to start building that back up. And some of that has been soured with a lot of the current council members. And so we need to start unpacking that very complicated puzzle because I don't think it's as simple as one answer. Oversight, the civilian oversight committee yep. to 
and keep an eye on the police department and make sure that these experts who are enforcing the laws are doing so in a fair and balanced way. Um, that did not happen this year. Uh, do you think that's something that should happen? Yeah, I, I think, again, so you got your experts and you got your community. So how we integrate the community, whether it's a civilian oversight committee and we find a way to, and again, you, you, and you highlighted, there's distrust and there's fear. And, and, it's, and right now, the, the language that's being used has neither side wanting to come to the table, right? So we need to, that's step one to me, is to, 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 sh to, do, to have a leader in place in Des Moines who's not going to fuel those, but bring both sides to the table, sit down, have the conversations, bring down the rhetoric a little bit so that people are, don't have their fisticuffs up, right? So that they're ready to come back to the table. I think that's step one in any of these issues. But you know, once we're there, yeah, I think that even, even if you talk to the Des Moines Police Department, they would say, and they would probably say they've been doing it because there are plenty of community organizations in Des Moines that have been around for a long time that have been partnering with the Des Moines Police Department. Now, are we at a stage where we need to take a, a look at that and see if we need to step up the game, step up the partnership a little bit because one side or both sides feel like maybe the, the Des Moines Police Department isn't properly um, you know, there's, there's lots of different solutions to what the community is calling the, or what the community is identifying as problems with the Des Moines, Des Moines Police Department. And, and I think the Des Moines Police Department would tell you that they're ready, they're game for some of these innovative solutions. They, they want to hear what are the funding sources, what are, what are your innovative ideas, where are we going to scale resources, or, or where are we going to find experts that we can partner with. I, I don't think the Des Moines Police Department has said anything to the contrary of that. And so I think they're ready to talk, they just need a leader who's going to bring down the rhetoric and bring people to the table. We continue with Corey McAnally on our website, his thoughts on marijuana, enforcement, food, insecurity, and more. We are Iowa.com. You're watching This Week in Iowa. Let's quickly recap these three candidates. Incumbent Josh Mandelbaum, challengers Brandi Weber and Corey McAnally again. Their full interviews on our website, weareiowa.com. Don't forget the election is November 2nd. Thank you so much for joining us here on This Week in Iowa. Don't forget we have a podcast on Spotify. Just search We Are Iowa. Have a great weekend, everyone.